thank you for being on time and <laughs> apologize to, for us uh, being a little bit late. Um, there might be some people joining in later, so I hope we are all open to um, a bit of a flux uh, in case uh, people are having their, their breakfast and, uh, <laughs> and coffee a bit late. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Corina Bucha. Um, my role today is to facilitate and animate, uh, hopefully, this discussion, which I think um, it's a great opportunity for us also to reflect on, uh, on the big topic that is uh, proposed today, the state of the arts. Um, my, I'm a cultural manager, I work in Cluj, I've been working in the last 10 years um, in the independent cultural sector and I will invite uh, Ragica and Galuka to say a few words about themselves also and I would also mention that um, our uh, third guest, uh, Yulia Popovic, unfortunately couldn't make it for various reasons. Um, so, Ragica and Galuka, Galuka maybe, since you are the guest. <laughs> well, actually, I <laughs> will uh, uh, include my presentation in the presentation, yeah, just in, in my input. But mm -hmm. shortly, I'm a cultural shortly. manager and facilitator. I'm based in Bucharest. And I've been working in the cultural sector mainly in Romania for 11 years now mainly with NGOs, but also with uh, public administration. I also was the counselor of the Minister of Culture in 2016. Um, yeah, and I have studies in cultural policy, so I'm a cultural policy specialist, let's say. But my main profile, I think, is in between the practices and the institutions. So I, I see myself as uh, bridging the distance between these two uh, in various ways. And uh, I will talk about it as I will also give my input for the discussion. Okay. Well, so I'm Raritza. I think most of you know me, but I will just say these few words about me. Besides being, uh, uh, especially in in the in this framework of reshape, uh, I'm a co-founder of Altar Foundation. In this panel, I'm mostly representing a different hat of mine, which is that of working for the Cluj Cultural Center, which is an organization that um, has, uh, has as, as members the local administration, the universities, the local cultural organizations. And what we did was we worked for about seven years to prepare the bid of the city of Cluj for the European Capital of Culture title. Mm -hmm. We didn't get the title, but we carry on with implementing the program. So the, the center's role is to implement this program that has been developed during those years of consultations and involvement with the local cultural sector. And uh, yes, uh, my uh, intention in, in this uh, precise panel is to present the results of uh, work, which is not completely finished, but we of a research that we've done on the um, on the work of the cultural work of the status of cultural workers in Romania. Okay. Um, so Julia joined us also. I'm sorry, Julia, we, we weren't sure if you were going to make it or not. Um, would, can I invite you to present yourself very shortly or? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Julia Popovic. I'm a cultural journalist. Okay, very that shortly. Thank you. For <laughs> <laughs> That's a good example for very shortly. Um, okay, so uh, just a yeah. question, like, is, since we are so few, I don't know if it's maybe mm -hmm. uh, easier for also for you if we have a, a quick round of yes, everyone who's in the room. Yes, that would be very yeah. nice. Uh, uh, yes. Well, my name is Nico Box. I'm a cultural living in And I was one of the advisors for the V shape. Uh, I know. <laughs> 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 Hello. <laughs> Now you get to know each other. So, hi, I'm Christina, just working for Altar. Yeah. And 
hoping to make this meeting good for all of you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Claudia. Uh, I am interested in uh, cultural uh, research. I'm working now in Cluj Cultural Center, and I'm here to, to learn more about this environment. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Mariana. Uh, I come from Zagreb, from the organization called Pogon, which is the uh, Zagreb Center for Independent, Independent Culture and Youth. Uh, we are also a partner in Reshape Project, and I work uh, in Reshape uh, as a communication manager. I'm Maria Vlahu, based in Portugal and working for Access Culture, which is an association of culture professionals working on barriers to cultural participation, physical, social, and intellectual. There are some people coming in. <laughs> <laughs> they have to present themselves immediately. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I'm, hi, I'm Georgia. I'm a visual artist from Skopje, North Macedonia. Um, I work a lot on the independent art scene. Soon I will start working in one new established institution which was created under the same model of, of Pogon, Center Yadro, it will be the name. This is the short of it. I'm Vesela, uh, from uh, one of the partner uh, organizations, uh, Art Association for the Theater in Sofia. And uh, we are dealing with maybe all, all of independent performance, dance and theater in Bulgaria. <coughs> Hi, I'm Ekmel Lertan, I'm from Istanbul, now in Izmir. Ah, that's how it's called now. Another city. Yeah, another city. Yeah, so that's how it's called now. No? No, no, no. Yeah, okay, okay. That's true. Maybe you want me to bring your coffee? Yeah. Yeah, so you can have a coffee. Yeah, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, I'm a creator, educator, and uh, art manager, and okay. would you like just an all girls <laughs> plus dancer? <laughs> uh, I run uh, Amber platform in Istanbul, no, in Izmir, <laughs> uh, and used to run a festival of digital arts in Istanbul between two, 2007 and 15. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Wafa Bigesem and I'm the founder of Culture Funding Watch in the Culture and Creative Enterprises Index. I'm a fundraiser for the last 15 years of my career, but specialize it now in... My company uh, works on intelligence gathering, research, and support and resource mobilization for the arts and culture. Hi, my name is Lupe and coming from uh, Barcelona, working for the Goethe Institute Barcelona, partner of Reshape and uh, organizing um, uh, two of the workshops of Reshape, one important year, but it was, it has been, and uh, we are now in, in four weeks, uh, in four, sorry, in four <laughs> weeks time uh, we will be in, in Barcelona with the group. Hello everybody, I'm Nikkei Jonah, let me stand up, I'm quite full of it. I'm Nikkei Jonah, I'm based in London. I work for an organisation called Counterpoint Arts that seeks to mainstream the contributions that um, migrants have made to sort of like the arts and cultural scene in the UK, but also they seek to mainstream migration period. We do a lot of it through the arts. With my other hat on, I also run a showcase in South Africa called the Pan-African Creative Exchange and it's about really addressing the mobility issues that artists on the continent have by bringing the arts world to them on the continent every two years. Um, I'm Alex. Um, okay, so I have two hats today. I have more hats, but I, I will talk about two hats today. Uh, one of the hats is I am part of the Cluj Cultural Center. 
And the other hat is I am part of the Akasa Collective that uh, some of you will visit uh, in the next part of the week. So we will get to talk about that more then. Uh, and that's all. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Rana. I'm, uh, I'm also a researcher uh, focused on cultural policy and uh, cultural manager. Um, right now based in Germany, uh, in Germany and uh, I'm also one of the advisors uh, of Reshape. On another hat, uh, I'm a board member in Etijahat, which is one of the partners also of the program, but I'm not officially representing them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to the right. Advertising. Yeah. So we have some oh, yeah. newcomers. Yeah. Can you also introduce yourself? Uh, Vesilin from Bulgaria, Sofia. Bulgaria. 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 I'm Marina from Bilbao, Spain. I work in a community cultural center called Karsarean. And we work through collaboration and participation in a neighborhood in, in Bilbao. And I'm taking part in trajectory three, the value of art in social fabric. My name is Oscar de Carmen, so I'm part of the reset group. Um, I work in with uh, Martina Martinka Bobilkova, so we are artists duo for 14 years now. Um, uh, our practice is more like a uh, collaborative practice, community practice, and uh, sometimes we extend our practice more mm -hmm. like in the idea that we are creators, so we organize some kind of project and so we create some kind of institution to confront the big institution and this system. Yeah, so. <laughs> 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 so you have the last chance to present yourself because we will start <laughs> <laughs> as you go in directly. <laughs> I'm Anastasia Kizilova, I'm from St. Petersburg, Russia. I'm in Solidarity Funding Project for Shapers. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry. And welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so we have a, well, first of all, let me say we have a very impressive attendance today and I'm really impressed by all your backgrounds and um, all the experience and uh, the different perspectives that you bring to this meeting. Um, I think it's great to, to be in such a, uh, such a great company. Um, but we also have a pretty ambitious, let's say, um, um, uh, objective for the meeting today because I'm sure some of you are curious about a bit of context on the cultural sector in Romania. Um, I'm sure not all of you are very familiar um, and I'm sure all of us are also curious of uh, bringing out, out of this dis discussion, maybe some inspiration for the topic of your meeting, um, which I'm, well, one thing that I'm very sure about is that we have the right people here to talk about that. Um, and also because I think this topic of um, uh, state of the arts, um, where the arts and the cultural sector is today, is, can be seen from two perspectives. Uh, one is the policies perspective and one is the practice perspective. They don't always meet, unfortunately, but uh, fortunately I think um, uh, both uh, Raluca, Ravica and also Yulia have, can bring on some input from these two perspectives. From what you are, what we are doing, and what is the state of the art in terms of policies, and in terms of structures, in terms of um, all this context, more political context that we are, we have to deal with somehow, and what is happening on the practice side, on the practical side, what kind of uh, structures are actually being experimented, what models of working, um, how and what, wh how are we working together, and how do we work individually in this sector, uh, what can we learn from that and maybe what you can bring back home or what we can each learn from each other. Um, so from, from one point of view, I mean to, just to start with, I would invite uh, both Galuka and Gavica and uh, Julia to reflect a bit on these two, on these two sides in the, in the discussion today and I'm sure each, each of them have, uh, have uh, prepared something for, for, for these two perspectives. And also, um, we, like the, the structure of the meeting is that I would invite uh, each speaker to present a bit um, more information about um, um, the, the, their, their perspective on the subject. Julia, do you want to join us, please? 
please don't leave me alone. I need someone <laughs> on my right side. <laughs> um, and um, one, one, also one distinction that I would make also when talking about practice and policies on this um, uh, dual paradigm is that maybe on one side of the story, it, and I would, I would say this, uh, this is the policies uh, perspective and when we are talking about structures and about the, the political side of our work, I think this is mainly a uh, terrain, a field of uh, lamentation, I would say. Um, not in the very pejorative sense that you can imagine, but there are a lot of things that we can actually bring to the, to the discussion of what actually doesn't work and why things don't work as they should somehow, which is also something that I think we can learn from. Um, on the other side, on the, on the practice side, I would say that this is more the, the field or the perspective where we can relate more to experiment, to how we can reshape the current conditions and how, what we can learn from them, um, which is also, of course, related to, the, to what the cultural sector in Romania is mainly, let's say, um, um, identified or defined by, which I'm sure it's, there are terms with which you are used in your work. Uh, precarity versus solidarity, it's something that we are, it's, it's the words that we use mostly I think in the, in the, um, uh, in the cultural sector today, in the art sector today. Um, what we can do with that and what kind of field of experimentation and uh, rethinking this offers, it's something that I would like to somehow reflect on uh, today in the meeting. So. First of all, I would invite Raluca to uh, tell us a bit her story, <laughs> or her side of the story, um, and uh, tell us a bit about the projects that she is and has been involved in um, in the last years, and so what we can learn from that, of course. Yeah, I will actually focus on what can be of value to, to you, the, the people <laughs> in front of me. Uh, as I said, I position myself and I have done so since the beginning of my work in 2007 as a bridger between practices and policy. Uh, and I will start uh, my uh, short intervention now with the story of how I actually got hired in the first place at the cultural contact point, which as you might, some of you might know, is the, pre uh, is the, um, is the former structure that now is called the Creative Europe Contact, mm -hmm. uh, Creative Europe yes. Desk. Thank you. Thank you. So it is a basically a structure um, based usually in the ministries of culture or mm -hmm. in some sorts of agencies, which helps cultural operators understand how they can get the funding for cooperation projects and other types of funding from the European Union. So uh, I remember my interview, I went to the person that uh, was to be my, my next boss and he asked me, why do you want to do this? And I said, look, uh, I think that people who are doing projects together are actually like uh, writers. They are writing some sort of literature which actually has the chance to come true. And uh, I mean, I was 23 then and I was, uh, of course, uh, partly naive and very much infused with the enthusiasm of being in 2007 and mm -hmm. Romania had just joined the European Union and uh, for young people like myself, uh, you know, middle class uh, with coming from uh, families that were able to support them during university, there was this wave of enthusiasm that now we are part of the big European family and uh, there is also all this horizon opening up which will eventually also lead to uh, a lot of improvement in our own countries, in our own cultural sphere. And um, I, I won't say that uh, none of this came true, but for sure the wave of enthusiasm and this idea that um, we are now going to write beautiful stories together um, uh, where art will be the core and people will have a better life through the arts uh, was not uh, all fulfilled, <laughs> I would say. But one thing I think uh, stayed true to, to, to my own core as a professional, I think it's also relevant to this idea, um, to, the, to this perspective linking policy and practice, that um, I think that if we focused on, uh, on projects and on, on, and, on, and on artistic interventions at European level, national level, local level, as stories, we actually uh, are able to ask ourselves really relevant questions about what stories are missing, who, who are the characters in the stories, uh, what characters are missing in the stories, how can we make the stories better, more interesting, more relevant, uh, do we have uh, a natural end to the story or is the story cut short, 
when, you, when it's not supposed to end. And um, um, going back now to a more practical um, part of what I did, in 2012 I founded together with two other colleagues an organization called Metro Group, which was meant to act exactly as this bridge between practice and policy. We were uh, founded to, with this idea to, to have uh, this arena where public administration can meet with cultural operators, with artists, and uh, improve policy making and improve cultural management practices. And we did studies, we did reports, we did advocacy as members of the coalition of the independent cultural sector for about three years. We focused on capacity building. We said, look, artists also need to know the legislation about transparency. We focused a lot on good governance. Um, there were some, uh, some, some small wins, but I would say that all in all, the effort was too much for the results that we got. Uh, I myself, I went to, uh, to study cultural policy making. I did my thesis on advocacy for uh, cultural policy in transition countries in Romania. I really um, um, made a really theoretical, quite complicated uh, analysis of pluralistic democracy versus deliberative democracy. I won't bother you with all these things, but I mean, I think that there are, there are quite a few people that put a lot of effort in taking this very conservative, very um, neat and very kuminda, I don't know what the name, what's the name in English, what, what? Wise. This very wise, no, very wise and very, you know... Um, well behaved. <laughs> well behaved, this very well behaved uh, stance on how uh, change, structural change can be, can be, um, can happen in, uh, in Romania. And, um, um, I've come to this point when, where after um, also I've been, as I said, uh, counselor to the Minister of Culture. I was in charge of drafting the national strategy for culture. Uh, I coordinated the local strategy of Timisoara, the long-term strategy. Timisoara is the city that eventually won the, the bid for becoming the European capital of culture. And I must say that, I mean, of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so arrogant as to say that I put all the efforts, I've done everything as best as I could. But I think that at this point there is really a question of how much well-behaved um, um, actions can we take in order to actually get to the answer that this is not the road to be taken in order to improve um, and to determine the structural change that we all want. And um, um, there are some other things that I would like to say, but maybe I will say it afterwards because I don't want to take too much time. Um, I, 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 yeah, I only want to stress this, that I think that the classic public, uh, public policy model and the classic view of, uh, of looking at cultural planning and looking at advocacy and looking at uh, improving cultural management and, uh, it does not work. And I think that for me, my answer now is to look at us, the cultural actors, and to see how we can rediscover ourselves um, and through that hope that maybe also the structural change will come. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I, I would just uh, just uh, um, launch one more question to you, because a lot of the initiatives in which you have been involved are very well informed by research and a mm -hmm. more deep, a very deep understanding of um, the the sector that that we are addressing and working in mm -hmm. somehow. So. I would I would ask you just um, how like from from all this uh, research and understanding what is in your point of view the defining point somehow the defining traits of the cultural sector today. Um, I know it's a big question, but maybe it's if a you very can big say question. three <laughs> three main three main characteristics that you would. Uh, I think the cultural sector has evolved. Even the public institutions have evolved in the sense of, of the vision that they have. Many of them have. I think that the the, the, the actor that ha that is lagging behind greatly is the public administration. So in that sense. Um, the, the, it's, not, it's not even a question of sabotaging the, 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 um, the creativity and the drives and the cultural practices through <coughs> institutional action. It's about neglect and it's about different priorities. I think that, and this comes mostly from my advocacy um, uh, activity, I think that when you don't have a partner of dialogue, you can be as smart as you can. <laughs> you, 
can have a lot of capacity, but you really need the people inside the administration or the parliament or the, you know, all, all, sta all levels of administration in order to drive that structural change. I didn't, I didn't think like that before. I just saw that there is a way in which we can get to them. There, for sure there is a way. We, we only need to, uh, to have more intelligent uh, papers drafted. We only need to have more meetings with them. No, I mean, truth of the matter, uh, this is the level of understanding I have now, is that you, you also need to have uh, the luck to have smart people as partners of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much that we can do coming from the cultural sector. And that's why I actually uh, focus now uh, more on practices. And um, uh, because you asked me about some key traits, um, I will only refer maybe to, to one, uh, which comes from my experience uh, with working uh, um, on building this community of practice between artists and schools, which is a big program I big program, big program on the, on the scale of what we can do as NGOs, of course, um, uh, in, for four years, there is, um, there is still a lot, there is a lot of enthusiasm of, of working across borders. Border, when I mean borders, I mean artistic borders and borders between the arts and other sectors. I think this is a terrain that uh, really needs to be more, more, uh, more looked at because um, I think this, this is also a chance for the arts to communicate to other people from the educational sector to the social sector to the environment to, to industry, how they can be relevant. It's not about instrumentalizing the arts, it's just about talking to different uh, people from different um, types of communities about what you can deliver and what, what is your value. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think more and more people are starting to understand that. Uh, not necessarily artists, but cultural managers for sure. <laughs> and if cultural managers are able to provide that space of freedom for the artists also to create, at the same time communicating the value of the arts to the others, I think that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe I was too abstract. I can, <laughs> I can be more, uh, I can be more uh, yeah, we'll concrete. Yeah, we'll the practical, <laughs> the practical side. Um, I would pass the ball to Julia, just, uh, and before I would just say, just, just mention that uh, her short and even her long introduction doesn't do justice to her experience. So, um, Julia, besides being a, a journalist, she's, um, um, I think she uses a lot her investigative and detective uh, <laughs> uh, abilities. Um, also in the cultural sector more, more broad in terms of advocacy and also organizing. Uh, one thing that I would mention about <coughs> your recent activity is the involvement in the Transitorial Association for the Independent Cultural Workers. Is that the correct term in English? Name in English? Or the I have no idea. I just know that a lot of members of the parliament just uh, made the confusion, the confusion between us. Transcultural and transsexual. <laughs> no, <laughs> can, I, at least I said transsectorial, right? I, I did say that. It was not a slip of tongue. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think also from I think um, your your experience and your activity also bridges these two parts: the practice, the practice, and the and the policies. Um, so I would invite you also to um, take this challenge of trying to make a portrait of the arts sector today, taking in consideration these two, uh, two perspectives. In Romania? Or in Romania, yeah. Well, among other things that I do in my capacity as a cultural journalist, I'm now I'm doing a research for a coalition between uh, FIM, FIA, and PERL, so union organizations for uh, mm -hmm. freelancers in live performing arts and employers' organizations in the same field. It regards the, uh, the, private, the private sector of the uh, very with me, it's going to be a little longer of the story. Uh, it deals with the private sector in live performing arts and it uh, involves the social dialogue. And uh, the first time I was proposed this, to do this research, I said it's very simple. Uh, there's n uh, uh, not the commercial, not the private, the commercial sector in the life of 
Well, it's very simple. There's nothing commercial in the in any part of the live performing uh, art sector in Romania, and there's no social dialogue because nothing an artist or a cultural worker do does in Romania is considered work. <laughs> Which pretty much solve solve the problem. <coughs> um, uh, and basically, it uh, meant that uh, it involves, uh, actually the project involves uh, several countries, Poland, uh, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, and, uh, no, uh, Poland, uh, Czechia, uh, Serbia, uh, Bulgaria, and Romania. And because uh, the problems were similar, the sector had to be reinvented as the non-public private sector. Uh, with the organization commissioning the, uh, the research saying, well, at least they had some money from the tickets. It's not all public grants. Uh, the next level was to uh, research the field. And the result is that during the last 20 years, there were uh, the number of graduates in uh, arts in general increased, um, while the number of uh, the, the revenue in the field in the non-public sector uh, remained the same in terms of, of euro and so on. Also, it proves that Romania has the lowest uh, rate of employment in culture, which is 1.6 percent. Uh, to our great delight, Turkey has three uh, had in 2015 3.45, and our neighbors, the Bulgarians, had over 2 percent. So, uh, and. Then I had uh, uh, this uh, research interview with a guy who is the manager of a very important and famous Romanian hip hop uh, group, DOG Mafia, <laughs> <laughs> who is an absolutely great guy. And he told me, <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> we are uh, still, uh, the whole musical uh, field is in the, uh, e still in the era of. Uh, bars and restaurants, uh, and well, his what version, his version, his uh, formulation in Romania was Krishme ah, okay, <laughs> that's a big difference. <laughs> nice. uh, which uh, uh, so uh, you know, uh, musicians uh, singing, uh, playing in bars mm -hmm. and restaurants, mm -hmm. because I even mean. when they perform on large stages, that's the mentality and that's the economy behind it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I asked, well, you see, uh, in 2015, we had the government falling because of an, uh, an accident, a fire, that killed all the, pretty much, well, the members of a, of a band. Uh, nobody, well, had a problem with the fact that they didn't have any insurance, for instance. Uh, it wasn't considered a work accident. Um, it was like if they were amateurs, like in their own dorm performing. Well, you know, people here do what they do because they love it. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody loves it so much uh, that uh, <coughs> everybody's okay with the thing that. Uh, there were, there are in the ho in the live performing sector, um, five thousand graduates, so graduates, in the last fifteen uh, years, <coughs> uh, but uh, two two thousand six hundred uh, employ in, uh, people employed, which also includes the, those that graduated before. It's not like only half of the graduates got employed. It's like from the everybody who is an artist in 2017, out of which 5,000 
graduated in the last 15 years, only half of those who graduated in the last 15 years are officially employed. Um, we love it, we do it for hobby, and we love it so much uh, that, uh, for instance, in music, everybody uh, plays in Romanian because they uh, pretty much uh, depend on uh, certain gigs in, uh, paid by bars and city halls where the requirement is for them to be accessible to the audience and to play in Romanian, which means that they have little chances to go abroad and to export themselves. We love it so much that here the four of us are wo all women. And there's in parallel another panel where everybody's <laughs> a woman too. Because there is a phenomenon called the genderization of poverty. When in a field or in a panel you only see women, that's the first time that, and it's not framed in a feminist thing, that's the first, the conclusion that you have to, to draw is that in that field is very poor. <laughs> Um, oh, that's a reason why, for instance, 99% of film producers in Romania are women. And directors are men, because <laughs> that's a paying job. Here, most of the men are artists. Most of the women are also organizers, producers, administrators, managers, mm -hmm. theoreticians. Uh, in general, all cultural <coughs> managers tend to be women, and artists tend to be men. Yeah. Do you want me to continue <laughs> with <laughs> the <laughs> shape? <laughs> you just got to see it now. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, this uh, transsexual, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the transsectorial association of cultural workers was born uh, in the beginning of uh, last year when uh, the text code was uh, reshuffled in a dramatic manner. First in a way that was uh, very damaging to the artist, then in a way that was very uh, favorable to artists, but nobody could understand it in the, in the cultural field. Um, the, um, so everybody was panicked first because the first version of the text code uh, proposed uh, uh, in, at the beginning of last year had to be changed because otherwise it would be death for everybody because they, the system proposed, the, the ministry proposed to tax everybody uh, in the cultural field, so everybody uh, mm, uh, having uh, a form of revenue based on author's rights and neighboring rights. Uh, this year based on the revenue of the last year. And that was extremely complicated to explain to them that, well, if an actor made a film last year, that actor definitely won't make a film this year. Because there, were, uh, there aren't en enough movies produced in Romania uh, to use the same actors. So it was rechanged and uh, in a very favorable way. And we had to organize an association because uh, a couple of us were offering non-stop uh, consulting in text and the concept of copyrights. Mm. And then the, this glorious idea appeared, let's make a union. Great, Which of who of you, who among you is employed? I'm not employed, but I have, uh, 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 I have an, NLC, an LLC. Good, so you're an employer. You can make an employer's association. Uh, and then they started asking, well, I, I want to get employed uh, in a public institution, because only public institutions employ. Um, Experience. No, yeah, but it's not experience. <laughs> yeah, work not. experience. Um, no, the work experience uh, that you have as an employee. Yeah. Like the numbers mm -hmm. of years that are accumulated the and then formal. Form, form the formal, the uh, formal, the the time that you were involved in a uh, in a labor relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. oh. 
So they start asking, am I going to the uh, 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 tax department to ask for papers to prove this? Nobody can prove it because it only applies for those in involved in a labor relationship mm -hmm. and nobody is working in the cultural field in Romania. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you. I was I thinking that, ah, sorry. No, I'm yeah, done. Yeah. I was just yeah. beating about the bushes because you said yeah. you told me to continue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can go like that for the <laughs> we know, we know. equivalent <laughs> of the two years. <laughs> 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 Maybe yes. we can give a bit of a context uh, on two topics. First of all, um, what changes in terms of legislation are relevant in the last 10 years in terms of this kind of actions where people feel like we need to get organized and we need to unionize? None. Or, uh, well, this was a reaction. With th this, the, the birth of the association was a reaction um, or it was the maybe um, secondary effect of the um, fiscal law, of the change in the fiscal law, right? Yeah. And, and just, just uh, the second point is also because you brought up the very important topic of uh, unions, and we do have a, a, a history which we won't go in depth, uh, but we do have um, um, union, unions of artists. And I think maybe it would be a bit helpful to understand how they work, why they don't work, how do they work in different fields, just to get a bit of a, bit of a picture. And how do uh, contemporary artists and independent artists fit in this picture? Well, first, uh, to start with the end, uh, mm -hmm. there is no union of artists. There are unions of employees in public institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, they work extremely well for their members who are uh, employees of the state and are subject to all the legislation protecting every employee of the state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, the labor code in Romania defines work, uh, labor, uh, work ex be ex being uh, the form of dependent hierarchical labor relationship formalized in a labor contract and since this year uh, it also applies for daily laborers contracts. Uh, daily laborers contracts are only for unqualified people uh, but it gives, let's uh, uh, say, a little hope for technicians with no uh, formal education in the independent sector. But usually our techni technicians are very qualified and doing unqualified work. Uh, otherwise, there's no change, no relevant change at all. The only thing that happened is the constant raising of the... Um, Personal, uh, not personal, but the uh, the tax allowance for uh, authors' rights contracts and uh, neighboring rights contracts, uh, which is which for the time being is the biggest in the whole world. I think it's forty percent of the gross income. Uh, and this very, uh, very high allowance uh, is one of the reasons why there's no pressure from among the artists for them to have labor, uh, labor contracts. Uh, because uh, the, uh, because uh, they uh, having 40% of their income not taxed, and not uh, uh, entering the, uh, the uh, yearly revenue that is subject to mandatory contributions, they have the very un uh, otherwise fake impression that they uh, uh, gain more money. Uh, so when they have to choose between uh, having 40% of the, the revenue not taxed 
and uh, but no protection whatsoever, no health insurance, no uh, uh, social uh, security, no uh, mm. medical leave, uh, no uh, ex no accident uh, uh, insurance, anything, or paying forty five percent in taxes for a labor contract and having all these that they are not very aware of how that serves them, everybody prefers this kind of non-labor contract. Otherwise, our association, which is pretty much uh, administratively dead, because nobody's, it gets, it needs a lot of uh, voluntary work that nobody's willing to do for the time being and uh, since there's no urgency and uh, everybody hasn't uh, solved the tax problems for the time being, this uh, voluntary work doesn't <coughs> exist. Uh, I, well, it, it was from the very beginning not a union. Uh, there was the, the, the uh, tendency to form uh, the, the, the will, the, the uh, desire to have a union uh, is, has been a long one, largely based on the fact that people don't, are not quite aware about the limitations of uh, the, uh, the right to union, to a union, what uh, the right to unionize me, that is only available because, because of its very definition and only applies to labor relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you search the uh, Register of Associations and Foundations, you'll see several things that are uh, uh, giving a hint towards being a union. Not to mention that uh, the whole the, the independent sector had at least three attempts in the last five years to m let's meet and have and make a union, and. Uh, uh, does this is a, re uh, a recurrent question with let's form a union and so on. Uh, then, uh, but the situation is as it is, and it's very difficult uh, to ask artists to understand some very complicated legal issues, because we have a, we have a local national issue with how work is defined in the labor code. But generally, this uh, 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 collective bargaining is, is limited uh, <coughs> through a European directive <coughs> on competition. And it's a very uh, narrow path to navigate in order to have the, the main uh, right that unionizing could ensure the field, which is collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. Collective bargaining of on one hand, minimal fees, and on the other hand, uh, working conditions. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will pick up on, on, on the subject of how do we define work and how, <coughs> what kind of evidence and what kind of data and what kind of uh, state arguments we actually have in order to make this, uh, to state this definition and also to argue it in front of um, all the structures, the authorities, the relevant stakeholders, which <coughs> can have an effect or can uh, make an impact on how it can be improved, right? I mean, to in order to make some statements and to in order to bring some improvements in how the how work in the cultural sector is working is, is functioning today, uh, we need to at least make sure that we have a common terminology that we know what we are talking about. And of course that we have some, some evidence to support it and we have a bit of knowledge which is evidence-based in order to um, make sure that, we, again, we all know what we are talking about. Um, so <coughs> I will pick up on that and give the word to Galitza because um, she has been working also on this part of research and also more political, um, maybe more political statements on how we can define and how can we understand and what kind of data we do we have in support of this understanding of work in the cultural sector. And I think, uh, well, first of all, the results are um, pretty mind-opening and they can tell us a bit 
more um, uh, consistently, um, so they, they, can, they, can, they can give us some information of what is this portrait of the cultural worker today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I mean, uh, I think there's a lot of things to, to, to add to the picture that has been already drawn. So maybe I would just first add some, some pillars to, to the conversation. First to say that the Romanian cultural sector has not been reformed since the socialism, which is probably different from country to country, but here in Romania there was no attempt to, to, to have a reform. And um, so we have, we have a budget for culture. I mean, we, we have cultural institutions. And, there's, and, uh, and there was this research that done um, by a group, including part of us, led by, uh, by Raluca a few years ago, um, when we had an action about uh, advocating for the living culture, mm -hmm. uh, when, where the, 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 the numbers there stated that more than 90% of the, of the money spent on culture in Romania are going to the public sector, and very little from that 1% that is left is distributed through open calls to independent structures. Mm -hmm. And this is never through, through structural, for structural purposes. So there is no mechanism for an independent structure to have their sustainability or at least their survival ensured. So the f that, that means that you always work from project grant to project grant, project grant. Also because of the fiscal years, most of the organizations will only have access to money from more or less from June to mid-November. And this is when you are going to do your work. And then if we are looking on what that means for the artists themselves, that they are not even, so NGOs, they can apply for this, but, but private individuals, if they, if they are not having a company or, or if they are not organized in a, in a, in a legal way, they cannot apply directly. So that means that them are only the, the beneficiaries of the, of the intermediation of these grants by organizations and institutions. And I think that tells a lot on, on how artists actually have very little space to define their own artistic agenda. And also to, to understand how to navigate this entire universe. So this is why there is a limited number of people, again, part of them in, in this room, that are, are even bothering with, the, with, with understanding these issues and, and trying to, to work around them. As Raluca <laughs> mentioned, for, for, for a long time we, we tried to advocate, to, we really believed that we could be well behaved and, and do something. We also protested, so I mean that was also, <laughs> and we had various forms of protest throughout the years whenever there were, were situations like the one that, that Julia mentioned when, when the fiscal law changed. And, and brought major challenges for the artists or when, when uh, the main sources for, for, for finance for the National Cultural Fund have been cut. But besides being very creative on how to protest, we also tried to, to show that we look, we meet with all the ministers, but you get tired after this time because you know it's 30 years since 89, and we had 32 ministers of culture meanwhile, so it's, some, I think the shortest time we had two weeks the Minister of Culture, it's almost impossible to, to even maintain the hope of, of um, so again I'm coming to your introduction, sorry it is a lot about lamentation, <laughs> the sort of, <laughs> of, of presentation having. So um, just, to, just to see um, what I wrote there, I will, I will post it here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or will you, will you help me? Okay. Ah, okay. But then I will have to read, so this is why <laughs> I'm standing. So, it, so these are the, um, I would like to share some data about some research. Part of it is data from Eurostat. Uh, they had um, a report on cultural work. I mean, it's the report is from 2017, but data is from 2016. And um, a <laughs> survey we did in Cruz Cultural <coughs> Center last year and this year and uh, well but then we didn't we, we have um, more or less around 300 replies so it's not just 
statistically valid, but it simply confirmed what we intuitively can say about about the cultural sector. So, Julia mentioned already we have the the sm smallest percentage of Romanian uh, of people working in the cultural sector, but you can see also that from the from what Eurostat um, reports, as people working in the cultural sector, which is 8.5 million, out of those only. Two million are actually um, like core art, like artists or art practitioners. The others are also people that do not work; that, that they don't. They are not artists, but work in in the field of culture. So technicians and administrators, or, or anything, um, or you know, financial managers, or people that have uh, in their working contract um, a job that is related to creative professions but work in other sectors, like a designer in industry. So, uh, yes, if we go further, this research has, only, has been only looking at the main job of the respondents, which I think it it is little relevant in the sector of culture, which I think everywhere in Europe anyway involves people having multiple jobs. And um, as you can see, self-employment of artists and writers in EU is 48%, which is compared to 15% in, in the rest of the economy, sales by itself. So yeah, we can go further. In Romania, we don't have a specific law that, that regulates the stat status of, of, for the artists or the cultural workers, despite various attempts of having one, it's true, it's a very complicated issue. So actually people mainly try to make a living from combining, if they're lucky, permanent contracts with, with temporary contracts. And these temporary contracts are these copyright, um, um, based on this copyright law or, or services, but like temporary services con contracts which, um, as, as Julia just mentioned, how labor is defined by law, which impl impl implies this dependent relationship, these contracts explicitly by, by, by the law are defined as independent. It means that all the risk has to be taken by the, by the worker uh, themselves. So that's the condition of that type of contract. <laughs> and the, the, the duration of such a contract is a month. So that's how you... And, and a lot of people are, are going to live from that. So in, in uh, the percentage, I think that's in, uh, yes, of, Romania, uh, of women working in the cultural sector in Romania is 50%. Um, and, uh, but but this, this again reflects a lot what happens in the, in, the, in the public sector. So most of the people that are employed and have a working contract in, the, in culture, they work in the, in the public institutions. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so in Romania, and this is kind of uh, interesting data. So if you look at the Eurostat information, what they will tell you is that 90% of the people that work in the cultural sector have a full-time job, and uh, even more than the total employment, which which so tells a lot that the data that that they aggregate in these Eurostat studies are just coming from the public sector, and they do not represent what happens on on the field. And 90 percent, 99 percent have a permanent contract, so which is totally not the case. <laughs> so. Uh, Going beyond that, um, this is more or less about the, um, the methodology of the research that, that, that we did, but we didn't have an amazing response rate, so it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's a convenience sampling. Um, we, we had um, a questionnaire and we had also a series of interviews. And, well, if Generally speaking, I think in the in in the Eurostat research, Romania in, <coughs> showed yeah, the Romanian culture workers had something like 50 or 60 percent um, tertiary edu education. In our sample, you see that almost everybody has um, has a university degree and quite a, a high uh, number of PhD. 
And I think what's also interesting is to see how, how arts goes in the family, that almost 40% are in the arts having had someone in the family that, that comes from the arts. Um, and, and you see that 53% of, of them, we, we also um, looked in our research on, we made a differentiation between artists and cultural workers and we wanted to see if there are specificities for, for, for these two. So they all, they all, more than half, they have incomes from other, from other <coughs> fields than, than their main artistic practice. Again, that tells about how you need to, to <coughs> navigate in order to, to survive. And half of the, of the artists do not have an employment contract. And also when, when we mean that half of the, the, them have an employment contract, most of them are those that work in the public sector and others are simply using this employment contract to, you know, on a minimum average salary, sometimes they are employed in the companies of their parents or their relatives or um, so something similar just to benefit from security, you know, mm -hmm. paying the minimal, mi minimum taxes, having this contract to ensure that you are mm -hmm. at least having this health coverage. So, but, but according to, from, from our sample, 34% explicitly said they do not benefit of any sort of health insurance. And when you look at the working hours, 31% work kind of less of part-time, but what you can see is almost half of them work more than 40 hours a week, and that more is much more, is 58 hours per week. So that means that at least half of the people working in, in this sector, they work one and a half time more than, than you're supposed to. And then this leads to a lot of consequences of you know, being burned out and, and exhausted. <coughs> Income, um, I think it's self-explanatory. The, the, the numbers there are the annual, average numbers, so that means that it's under 500 euro a month for most of the people. Is it gross fiscal net or net? It's gross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry not to mention that. It's <laughs> gross. So it's actually much worse in terms of, of what you Absolutely. survive from, yeah. So um, that is less than the average for 57% uh, of the respondents is less than the um, average income in, in the year of 2006. Yeah, um, ju just a little bit if you go back. Um, and 40%, they also say that in the past four years their income did not increase. So it, it was stagnant or did not increase. <coughs> while prices have increased dramatically in this year. So cost of living has, has increased. Um, and 44% report that their incomes do not cover their basic daily needs. And when asking them what, what are their kind of means of support to um, compensate this, mostly rely on partners. <laughs> Second, family <coughs> and the next, the, next, yeah. the next research should be about the partners. <laughs> Where do they get the money? <laughs> Hopefully they're not artists. Or yeah, exactly. well, yeah. So, um, anyway, only 59% have partners. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Exactly. That's also one thing. The main <laughs> partners are our parents. <laughs> Until you're 40, the I main really partners are not. your parents. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, only 24% of artists report that they had access to grants mm -hmm. um, in, in the last year, and that, that most likely refers to mobility grants. Mm -hmm. they, um, they, are, they report that most frequently the work they do is commissions for organizations, so they do not, uh, so it's the organization that defines the topic or the type of work they are, they are interested in. So 
and when they want to carry on their own project, almost half of the time is on their own money. And only 17% when they do their own artistic work on their own artistic agenda would be also paid for that work. And um, if we, y you can see 64% uh, had no opportunity for international mobility and of those that did, I mean, out of the total, those that there were people that did have mobility, but only 11% had been paid mm -hmm. for these traveling times. And if we go to the, you, you don't see much of this kind of cultural production cycle defined as defined by UNESCO, but the thing is just to say that out of all these stages that are necessary for cultural production, people find opportunities to, to produce their work and they find opportunities to show their work in, in festivals, in, in <coughs> venues, and, and they are paid for this, more likely to pay, be paid for this, but are very unlikely to be paid for their creation, for their research. So that type of work is almost <coughs> unaccounted for. And again, then, a lot of them are complementing their revenues by working in the cultural sector, but doing non non that their other work, like being managers for other artists, technicians for other artists again, or giving lectures, doing cultural training or, or um, courses. So um, I think this is the last slide. Uh, they still, and especially because we didn't really have um, debates on these issues, People are still happy to work in the culture. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, you see this, 60, 70% people are still happy to do this work. And most of the satisfaction, satisfaction comes from the artistic sides of the work, the creativity from doing what you like, from um, being in contact with public and, and, and the audience appreciating your work, uh, and having these peer-to-peer inspiring connections. But on the other <coughs> side, they do express their dissatisfaction with access to funding, to collaboration <coughs> with, with the or organizations and institutions, and, um, and mainly with the uh, job security, like with, with their security on living on, on, on art. And 60% have considered change, changing career, meaning that some of them thought, think about it around 40 something percent they have thought about changing career and something like um, over 12 percent, I can't remember exactly the, the number, they said that they have repeatedly considered the idea of giving up working in the art. So and I think, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure nobody's interested because it relates to Romanian law, but anyway. Uh, the examples you gave of uh, uh, copyrights, uh, licensing, and so on, they are by nature temporary. Because yeah, they are commercial, they are com they don't call themselves com temporary because all c but because they are commercial contracts and all commercial contracts are temporary because otherwise they are bogus employment. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. The point is simply to that that that's the that's the form that is mostly used to employ artists and and. Uh, it gives the workers. it gives the false and impression the that they are compared in any way with working with labor contracts or and using this term terminology gives really the, the uh, actually it gives the impression that the artists have and one uh, and I think in my discussions with them this impression is one of the reasons why they are not they are not totally outraged about how they are exploited there are these are not temporary contracts they are these they are treated as commercial actors, the copyright, the, cop uh, the copyright licensing is a royalties contract. So uh, it's like you either sell Madonna songs or uh, 
Tudor Kirila p- performs on uh, o- on a stage in uh, paid by the city hall, it's the same. Or you have uh, uh, you're self-employed, which is a commercial activity, and in Romania you also uh, as self uh, self-employment, the the legal form of self-employment allows you to employ I- other people. That's why you cannot unionize as, self, uh, as self-employed, mm-hmm. because actually you're also an employer of other people, which makes the self-employed person, artist, the same with the big oil company. Because in terms of, you know, the type of, the legally, the type of activity they are doing is the same. It's commercial activity. And uh, they have equal, uh, 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 the state doesn't give you uh, protection, any kind of protection when uh, making a contract because they consider that you as an artist has the same power of negotiation as a company because both, you both are doing commercial activities. And, and okay. probably and to add so to that, that uh, most of, uh, a lot of the people, especially those that are not artists, they open up their one-person company LLC, to deal yes. with that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see the dynamics of, of uh, 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 tax optimization using the, how do you say register of commerce? The company register. Uh, on the, uh, where you see the how uh, the number of uh, uh, the registrations in self empl- uh, of self-employed persons Central and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, and the number of uh, LLCs registrations uh, vary uh, depending on how the f- the tax laws change changes because actually there's this kind of, of uh, doing your activity in a l- the less uh, costly manner, mm-hmm. which basically forces everybody in a force uh, in a in uh, types of commercial uh, uh, relations that are treated by the state the same. Either you s- speak about a, a one-person LLC in the cultural field, mm-hmm. all the big uh, OMV oil companies. Which is the we can we can compare <laughs> our masters. Kaluka, <laughs> <laughs> you you, want, you had some more thoughts. On I, I wanted to add something, but no. uh, maybe I mean I, I just I noticed that I'm from a different picture than both of you are. You you were talking about the state of the arts, focusing on work relations and contracts and mm-hmm. and um, I now realize that my input in the beginning uh, maybe seemed like. Um, giving up on the hope that anything of this sort matters. And if we do that, what is left? And um, I would not think that this is lamentation on being tire- tired. I, I personally, I think that in a way, it's just maybe this is more intelligent. Not saying that it's not worthwhile to put the energy in such research. Mm-hmm. But I would really question the purpose of this research if at the other end, of the dialogue, there is no one to listen to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this, uh, again, focusing on my experience as a counselor of the Minister of Culture, doing the national strategy where a lot of information, a lot of data has been processed, doing several researches, which I, I have not mentioned because I did that. I'm at a point in which I think that research only is valuable if there is someone asking for it. Uh, um, I know this is a bit radical because research in itself has the value of making us more o- aware of what is happening. But I think that if our purpose is actually to change the world <laughs> and not just be smart, which is a relevant point in itself, I think that the tactics need, n- tactics need to be different. And now I'm going to just talk a bit about the type of research I've done recently and which tries to incorporate that idea. Um, I've been fascinated by the concept of ecology of culture for a couple of years now. Um, Basically, I found out about it um, reading a report written by John Holden, who's a UK-based researcher. He published um, this report in 2015, commissioned by the um, uh, Arts and Humanities Research uh, Council, I think, of the UK. And um, the concept of ecology of culture that he presents, it's not new. He did not invent this concept, of course. But he um, proposes certain models of how we can look at the cultural sector 
and understand how it functions by, by thinking about, he has different models, but the one that really uh, drew my attention is the one about the interacting, interacting roles. So basically he says that um, it's not so relevant anymore uh, if we look at ourselves as actors, as NGOs, public institutions, independent artists. It's actually more valuable to look what, what we do and what is the role of what we do in the bigger picture. And he has this, um, this, um, his, uh, this model of where he divided these roles as being um, guardians, connectors, nomads and platforms. Uh, I mean, the titles are quite intuitive. I would not take the time to present them. But he says that these roles are interconnected and um, by figuring out better how what your role is and trying to see how that depends on what the other ones are doing, you can a actually start a more meaningful conversation um, than, um, than the ones that you can have by focusing only um, on the type of organization that you are and maybe your formal mission. And I tried to adapt that. I did that together with Stefania Ferkedo, who is also an independent researcher and cultural manager. Um, we did a, a study commissioned by, by, by the Gabriela Tudor Foundation, which is a foundation uh, working in the contemporary dance sector for a while now uh, in Romania and <coughs> focusing on cultural management um, competencies. Um, and we applied that to the contemporary dance scene and we tried to, to, to see how those profiles can be used in order to develop um, a questionnaire that would actually make also people aware of their role in the ecosystem. And we adapted those profiles because we thought that they are not, uh, they are not enough for the sector. So we actually also included the trainer, the mediator, uh, the promoter. Um, so we, we had, in the end we had six such uh, roles. And uh, why, um, and, and we did this uh, research in a way that at the end of it, we also got an image of, of the roles covered uh, by the actors uh, in, the se in, the, in the sector. But at the end, each, each of the people that, that responded also got back their own profile. Mm -hmm. So even if, you know, the, 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 the thing was that even if the, the recommendations, we will, you know, we'll have the recommendations at the end of the study conclusions for everyone to read, recommendations by types of actors to the National Cultural Fund, to the Ministry of Culture, you know, this well-behaved type of, uh, of research. But we, we actually thought it's important for each of the respondents to also get something back from this re research, something that will make it useful for him or her. I think that this, 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 um, this way of thinking about research, which immediately gets back also to the respondent, doesn't stay somewhere objectively, objectively where, where people can make use or not make use of the, of the objective type of, uh, of, uh, of conclusion. I think it's a, it's a more proper way of, to think about the role of research in a context as the context of Romania. And I would just like to read uh, just a couple, just the, the three main conclusions that we got because mm -hmm. I don't want, I mean, I think it's too specific to actually talk about this particular study uh, in, this, in this context. But the conclusions I think are relevant for more than the contemporary dancing. Mm -hmm. What we found out is that everything is important for people. So also I, I need to mention this. The way we, we, we made the questionnaire is that we asked about each role. Um, split into four dimensions, the competence dimension. So we, ha we asked about the, the priority that that role has for the person or the organization, the action, whether or not they are doing it, the attitude in general, whether or not they consider it important, and the knowledge that they have or do not have. So we, we kind of, we, we transform the role, in, we, we, we use the competence model of the role. So we, f we found out that um, most of the people and the organizations are taking on multiple roles. Mm -hmm. um, there is no clear specialization, and, but, but still, the, the profile that, um, that uh, went on the first, uh, um, uh, was the first choice, mm -hmm. both of people and organizations, is the nomad. The, oma the nomad being defined as that role which means that people that 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 um, it, was, it it means the circulation of the work of art. It means the 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 um, uh, the 
the action of, of looking for resources if you don't have them and, and moving around so in order to get those resources. I think it's interesting that both the people and the organizations are assuming this role to be of priority. While in fact you would think that organizations should because they have more capacity, right? I mean, you, do a, you have an organization because you, you mean to have a, a stronger role in the sector, maybe to give the floor to nomads to perform. Uh, while no, uh, we, we discovered that also organizations uh, seek this type of role. Again, the, que that the answer could be in the precarity of the system. There are also this information that uh, there is also this information that 53% um, of the organizations which replied have less, that, uh, have less than um, um, 80,000 lei, uh, which means like 18,000 euros. 18, euros annual budget for contemporary dance uh, projects. Um, and other 20% have uh, between 18 and um, 30,000. Uh, and 30,000 euros, mm -hmm. which is quite low. I mean, even compared to Romanian expenses, which is Even to the 500 exactly. euros per month. That you um, <laughs> what, again, what is really interesting, and I uh, think this comes back to the, to the, to the nice uh, comment that you made about, uh, um, about people still um, feeling that they get something out of being the cultural sector, they have a good motivation for staying in, which re basically relates to their uh, cultural work. It's the, the, the fact that many of them have in mind an ideal, an ideal profile, mm -hmm. while in fact their actual profile is very different. So um, we have this, uh, we, we found out that many take on necessity roles. Um, not necessarily the roles that they would like to have in the cultural mm -hmm. ecosystem, but the ones that they need to have in order to survive. So, for instance, you find also a lot of mediators, people who take on um, um, training uh, amateurs and, and um, making, uh, you know, sometimes more superficial, sometimes more, more consistent projects to, to educate the public. Mm -hmm. uh, but, in fact, um, if you look at the priority that they are giving to this in their own head, in their own or in their own organization, it's not so important to them. They are doing it. Their role in the in the e ecosystem is that of the mediator. But in fact, they would still want to be nomads. They would still wa want to be promoters or connectors. So this is this um, is this um, difference between the necessity role and the ideal role that each of us has. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, if this applies more to the individuals, I think that in the case of, in, uh, of organizations, I think the director of the National Dance Center put it quite nicely in the interview we had with her. She, she said that because of the precarity of the, of the field, she's only able to formulate cir circumstantial strategies strategy that you can stand so. Mm -hmm. so the whole idea of cultural planning, the whole idea of, you know, proficient cultural management with annual meetings with develop, uh, in which we develop long-term uh, plans for the future and in which maybe we redefine our mission, our vision, our goals. We do all those smart uh, exercises <coughs> that many of us have learned in school or in trainings or in universities. None of this actually matters that much mm -hmm. just because the actual context is so much fluctuating that you are only able to develop circumstantial strategies and necessity roles. And I think, you know, the, all this discussion, when, when we come back to research and to the state of the arts, I think it actually comes down to the idea, what can we actually do as researchers? What, what can be our role in this context? Are we more to be focusing still on this structural type of research which uh, it is important, so I would, you know, it's, it's very hard for me because I was trained to believe that this type of research is, is important. But is it really relevant now to the moment in which we are in? Or should we um, give up the status of being intelligent? Because personally, <laughs> of course, it's very nice to, to show, look, I've been working for two years now on this and I have all these figures and yeah, the question is what kind of what is the what, relevance? What kind of in abilities do we need bes besides being uh, intelligent? And like, do we have to be witty? Do we have to be 
cunning, greedy, maybe, uh, pretty, happy. <laughs> Like and who are we to talk about the state of the arts? That's, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. Who are we to talk about the state of the arts? What is the position from which we communicate this research? Who are we actually? I mean, what is our role mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the big ecosystem? Yeah. I, I think, yeah, what, yeah, what, what you mentioned uh, about, about the roles is, in my point of view, it's also what I relate to greatly is um, exactly on, on this on this perspective of how do we define ourselves and this is like for me it's important to know in what kind of picture do I fit in exactly. as a cultural worker when I start being worried about the 500 euros that I earn per month and when I have I have moments when I'm thinking am I the only one in this world who is just wondering how do I survive and then I realize no actually there are others actually the statistics say that um, actually, there are you know like it's it's it it helps me and I think and I hope it other it helps others define their role and just understand it or accept it somehow. Or there is even research that says that if you do not have enough specialization and capacity building in organizations, there is not even a question of um, talking about organizations anymore. Mm -hmm. So what is an organization? It's not a legal. It's not a legal thing that you declare at the, that. Okay, that's a perspective. It's a gypsy caravan by the. But <laughs> the distinction, for <laughs> instance, between local networks, networks mm -hmm. and organizations, only makes sense if you have organizations which have a certain type of capacity. If not, it's a completely different picture. And I think we should actually look more at mm -hmm. a social anarchy perspective to look about organizations in that way. I think it's a very good time to, to really shake a bit this well-behaved type of research and advocacy and looking at what our work. Mm. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think this I is. Uh, I would just uh, 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 add that, that I think this is exactly why the Risha project is there and mm -hmm. what are the questions that we are trying to answer in this project. You know, mm -hmm. like we all figure out it's not working. This 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 type of of approach is not working anymore. I mean, in this case. I'm not so necessarily defensive, but I feel like I need to do this, um, <laughs> is that the research that we did in Cluj Culture Center is that we, as an organization, we define ourselves as an intermediary organization that took on this responsibility that at least in Cluj we try, we have, we have this willingness and, and we put effort in it in supporting the cultural sector. And we thought that the first step we need to take is to understand better beyond our intuition what happens. And, um, and also, we have some ways to, in mind to use this in, in the fact in we like we, we plan to offer a few grants for, for experimentation on new models, mm -hmm. on how you can go about and then try to learn something from that. So it's, it's a way of doing things and, and, and I understand the value of the, the type you approach you, you mentioned in research. I just took a rhetorical uh, yeah, yeah, antagonism so perspective yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the rhetorical <coughs> points, not necessarily. And, and I see that also one point where it's is, where is needed is there exactly that it's only us talking about these things and when there is no there is no information that you know we all quote on Facebook some UK researchers on everything nowadays like <laughs> from nutrition to to the moon we also need to quote some <laughs> research to say to, to put into the context where we are as cultural practitioners in this country um, I would open a bit the conversation with you because yeah it says that this is something that this meeting is supposed to, or it's, it, it aims of bringing, of stirring up a, a little bit, and I'm curious to see what shakes you. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back on the question about, about what type of research, and should they be very advocacy-related um, strategy or purposes rather than understanding. I, don't, I disagree a little bit with you, because it's joining what we're saying about, it's about knowledge nowadays. I mean, if you want to have a healthy ecosystem for that cultural, art and culture, um, uh, the art and culture ecosystem in any in, 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 in space, the knowledge, the accumulation and treatment of knowledge, it's one of the first pillar we will build in a healthy and knowledgeable ecosystem. 
And still, when you're talking about ecosystem, just like, like take the, the word dans son sens brut, the first one, an ecosystem, a bee, doesn't think about where she's taken that uh, pollen from another because you never know what that uh, grain, the grain de pollen, you know, they, you know? Yeah. 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 You never know what would happen with that because you can never ever have a full picture of what are the dynamics motivating the different player in that ecosystem? What are the needs of every single player in that ecosystem? So I think, and the first, when you are in the stage of building that ecosystem, you cannot never know what direction is take. And I think we <coughs> should work on data generating, no matter, not necessarily related to a specific targeted action or specific targeted objective. That's one thing. I want also to build on, um, also to comment on where you, when you said about um, um, the by necessity, um, uh, the positioning of different institutions or player that uh, the, what they are doing now, what they positioning in activities now, does not reflect what they wish to do, but actually the necessity they have to do. I read it from another perspective, and I read it from the resource mobilization angle, and um, there is a word for that in the fundraising, like resource mobilization word, it's called a donor driven. And then most, and that's what the, one of the biggest danger that an institution or organization could fall in when they are more, the, their strategy and their project directed to where the money is to survive no. rather than what they really want to do. And if we look from the, the uh, ecosystem combined with the funding and resource mobilizations uh, reality, there is a, re a really very strong correlation betw between them. Um, one of the main issues, for example, we're studying now in Tunisia the, what, are, what are the mechanism, financial mechanism put at disposal of the art and culture scene and players, and we figured out that um, there is, at least from the policymaker side, there is a very narrow understanding of what is uh, the use of the financial or the resources they have that they could put at disposal of the actor. For them, it's only grant. The only thing that Ministry of Culture in Tunisia could do <laughs> is give grant, 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 which is wrong because the grant is one tool to channel support to the actors and their role should be wider than giving grant. It should be financial guarantee, should be empowering, uh, bringing more investors and play that in the wider sense of investor player in the sector. And that's that impacts how those organizations, the ecosystem in Tunisia, they function and how they strategize. And during this study, for example, we were really quite surprised at that um, even well-established uh, organization and institution in Tunisia don't really have strategies. Like beyond the fact that they have by necessity to do, to expand their, uh, their, um, their activities to a field that they don't really want to be in, they don't have the time and they don't, they're not given the means to sit and say, okay, this is the situation where I want to go in the next two years. It was really hard for them when we sit to talk to them and said, yes, I would like to do that. I can't do it first because there is no skills. Second, there is no literature about how to strategize <coughs> in at least the Tunisian context. Mm -hmm. a third, I don't have the means. And fourth, I need to do this and that because it's the only way to get some cash to make, to fund other activities that I really want to do. How can you know, what 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 like from our um, context and our Ministry of Culture? What can you relate to on I mean, this? Because you I have the totally insight. I can totally relate to what you're uh, saying in the sense that uh, I'm a defendant of knowledge uh, without uh, without any consideration of the advocacy use. But I'm saying that myself, I will not be engaged in such an effort anymore because I personally feel it use, useless in the Romanian context. That's what I'm saying. I think, I think universities are, are perfect and should do that more. Um, I think that there was a lot of effort put already in Romania into gathering this type of research. As I said, I was in the Ministry of Culture. There is an annex of more than 50 pages of processing data about the cultural sector, which we then, you know, um, interpreted for the purpose of the strategy. I've done that. I've done, as Arisa said, we've done that for the living culture. 
um, a charter that we sent to the parliament where we actually said that there is a need for the diversification of tools and, and funding uh, instruments, not only grants, but also subsidies and uh, bringing in maybe also private investors and doing mobility grants for artists. And you know, we are smiling because this has been said not only by us, but by Yulia, by Corina, by many other people since, uh, since the 90s so far. I mean, my conclusion is at the end of so many efforts that have looked at things as you are looking at them. And I'm not saying that this is not a, a correct perspective standing on firm grounds. I'm saying that maybe we also need to take an alternative route and be less well behaved. <laughs> I think I will uh, actually <laughs> use this uh, more, and more and more because in our context it is not working. In the Cluj context, and I, I actually wanted also to answer back to Raritza mm -hmm. because I think that where, where you do have a partner of dialogue, where you, in, in the public authority, where you do have at least some hope, you, you see some glances, some signals that there is someone there listening to you, then the, the, the relevance of such uh, studies as you did, uh, it, it has, has firmer grounds. Mm -hmm. So I, I, what, I, what I mean in the end, I mean as a conclusion, is that I, I connect the, the relevance of this type of, of research about the state of the arts to the existence um, of a partner of dialogue which might, which might listen mm -hmm. at least partly to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. When there is no such partner of dialogue, I think we should not insist in this type of attitude anymore. Mm -hmm. That's all. <laughs> Julia, I'm curious if you trust or if you think we can trust any institutions or institutional processes today in Romania. Where is there some hope? <laughs> you know that uh, the Minister of Culture and Government Department are not institutions. Yes. They are authorities. Yes. They have yes. this. Uh, yeah as opposed to institutions, they have this prerogative of mm -hmm. public power. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me about institutions, yes, of course, look at the National Dance Center. There you go. Why, why do you trust the National Dance Center? I mean, what can we learn from that? What kind of positive example do you think there is? Uh, <laughs> and of course I'm sorry, what's the purpose of this question? Um, <laughs> to bring the, a bit of positive and uh, good practice example from everything that goes wrong or can be improved, if there's anything that we can bring up as a well, example. put your uh, clock on because it's going to take a while. It's not that simple to answer. Uh, and I have to know how many minutes do I have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have officially 13 more minutes in this meeting. Uh, we can prolong it. Um, I will try to keep it under 13 minutes because okay. 13 is not a good number. <laughs> uh, well, the National Dance Center uh, start, started as an institution forcefully uh, extracted uh, from the public authority under the uh, extremely public pressure of artists. So it was... Uh, it was uh, for many years after its founding, an artist-run institution, something that uh, uh, even if it belonged to an ecosystem uh, of institutions uh, that are not uh, 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 very uh, are not tolerable with artist-run structures, um, that's what. Uh, at the, uh, after the first, uh, during the first five years of its existence, brought this accusation of being actually an independent organization, not a public institution, because the way it uh, acted as an artist-run thing was totally contrary to uh, the way performing arts institutions were devised and uh, uh, according to the type of work they we're supposed to do. But you would say that it's a positive thing to be as a public institution. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, did I say? I did I say I finished? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, what happened afterwards was a crisis, 
And actually this uh, crisis forced it to get out of the artist-run organization structure into something uh, based on uh, 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 decision-making processes that are transparent and predictable and at the same time um, remaining totally flexible in the face of totally underfinancing and uh, un uh, under support that it got from the, the, the public authority. And I think it, uh, at this moment, I think it starts to look as a, a, a new model of institution, even if I don't think that there's any other possible institution that could follow that model. But it, uh, it depends on what happens with it after Vava leaves. And what happened with, uh, with it after, if and after it gets the new venue that was given to it and everybody forgot about it. <laughs> Did anyone know about it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to leave a bit of silence to make sure. <laughs> 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 but it's good, it's good, yeah. Okay. Um, Please, reactions, questions, yes. Maybe I can say something about this uh, research and also relation artist um, organizations. So I know of a uh, research project in Belgium that has been um, carried on by artists together with legal advisors and some um, experts. And they took the contract as a research tool. So how contract is often, uh, a they call it a transactional contract in the arts. As an artist, you give something, a gig or a presentation, or you promise to produce new work, uh, and you ne negotiate about how, how much will be paid, um, what is the timing, and it's, it's um, relational, but also um, the risk is not shared. It's often the artist who is in the end responsible to deliver and the artist will sometimes say I will ask for a grant but the grant that didn't come and it's up to the artist then to, to solve. And they said well why can't we change the contract more into um, a tool to uh, negotiate um, and to talk about what are the resources, what can we do for each other not only in terms of one gig or one exhibition but also maybe also in the longer term and so the, 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 the research project was also a bit artistic in a way that uh, artists um, created a new tool for, um, which is also legal. In the, in the end, it was supposed to be also something that can be used to change this, um, I, the, 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 the relations which are often hierarchical between uh, organizations and artists. And so it, it's, it's also a way to do other types of research to involve uh, uh, artists to change uh, with the artists their situation of work in conditions. That's a small idea. I think it's a positive example of uh, research. I'm curious if also, also from your side, but also from the room. Oh, sorry. You can come. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, if, uh, well, we, we talked about research, we, ha we talked about advocacy a little bit. Uh, maybe we can dive a bit deeper actually on that, on that uh, field because there are interesting practices also in Romania in terms of advocacy or uh, sometimes some creative uh, ways uh, uh, in terms of how we do advocacy for the cultural sector. But I'm curious to make a bit of a brainstorming also on other types of mechanisms that, or methods or just s simple tools that you think are in hand when you talk about how we define um, the work in the, in the cultural sector. Um, and not just data, and not just research-based, but also, I don't know, uh, Galuka, you were talking about stories, actually. Yes, I have stories to share <laughs> about uh, advocacy, and uh, mm -hmm. how I was this close to becoming a founding fund founder of the Constitution, of the Romanian Constitution. So okay. I think it was 2015, and there was this initiative coming from the many, you know, the big think tanks, big NGOs, that wanted to change the Constitution, and it was an agreement <coughs> made also by the, with the Parliament, some I don't remember exactly, exactly the setting, but I remember at one point I received an email 
um, from s some of the people working in these big think tanks. And uh, uh, it was not only addressed to me, but I was one, one of, the, of the people receiving the emails. And they said, look, we have this uh, Word file, and you have all the articles in the Constitution. And next week, please add your own uh, preference of how you think the, the articles related to your field of work should look like. And I was, of course, invited to, to make a proposal for the access to culture. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, you have until morning, please give us uh, just uh, your, your preference. And you know, it was, I think, at 10 o'clock in the evening, I was at my computer, I said, oh, okay, let me give a try, give it a try. And, uh, remember that at this point, uh, I was already working in advocacy for the administration of the cultural fund uh, with the coalition of the independent cultural sector for five years now. And I think we were, our biggest success was just, uh, you know, changing small articles in the, in the guide for funding uh, culture projects. So, okay, then going back to the story of the Constitution, I sent this, this proposal and I forgot about it, you know. But after a while, I, f I found out in the, in the news that, you know, you know, there is a new form of the Romanian Constitution which is going to be discussed uh, in the Parliament. And I just took a look at it to see how, how my access to culture article finally uh, finally looks like, I mean, and I was completely shocked to see that it was, it had the exact form that I was giving, I, I gave it in that evening at 10 o'clock in the evening, one day after the other, and I was completely in shock, and I said, but how could this be possible, I mean, uh, how, 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 because, you know, I mean, I did not give it so much thought, I mean, I just said, they just want a proposal, and then some experts will come and see what the legal, uh, you know, implication would be of doing that, I included something with intercultural dialogue, you know, some words I had in my head. I mean, the, the conclusion to this, in terms of advocacy, is that uh, it really depends where you are, in which circle you, you are uh, mingling. Mm -hmm. So, compared to the work I have been doing for the, with, with others, for the administration of the cultural fund, with petitions, with protests, with meetings, with the minister, and we only were able to change one small article in the guide. And if you look comparatively at this email where, where I was just included because I think someone in this big think tank knew about me and said we need to ask Raluca about it, uh, I was completely in shock because I just realized then that for advocacy purposes it really matters who you know and in one evening, you can, you can get this close to being a new founding father or mother of the Romanian constitution, which is shocking, which was shocking. In the end, it did not happen. But I, sometimes when, I, when, I, when I, there is a new emergency, you know, we have to do a new, a new petition, we have to do a new protest in front of the ministry, whatever ministry there is, I just remember this. Where am I placed to do advocacy? And the reality is that I'm in a very small NGO. We don't even have a, an office anymore. <coughs> and my ideas can be superb, but if I'm not present in the right circle, they will just go unnoticed. And that's, so I mean, sometimes that's, that's, that's one a good story. It's sometimes that's a good thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> so I was this close to being a founding mother of yeah, the yeah. Romanian <laughs> constitution. <laughs> no, I mean, yes, good. of course you have more. <coughs> <laughs> effect if you if you're in that point. But I mean it's just how do we expect the whole this independent sector to be represented some there by one to person? I, mean, I have an answer to this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really? Uh, this year well we are a, a, a continuing series of, of crises here. So this, uh, we have a very dynamic uh, kind of uh, inner cultural life. Um, and this year there was uh, a change in uh, the, account, the accountancy <coughs> of the state budget, basically, and uh, 7 million lei, which means, well, 1.7 million euros from the National Culture Fund, National Endowment for the Culture, for culture disappeared. It was an accountancy thing, so they were just kept by the Ministry of Finances, but they were like, kept from being used in the middle of a granting session. And uh, actually, uh, by uh, the end of the uh, movement, the, uh, those representatives of the independent sector who wanted to come 
uh, were able to come to uh, um, a session of the Cultural Committee of the uh, uh, Chamber of Deputies is the deciding chamber of the parliament in terms of uh, cultural law and have a discussion with the lady from the, from the Ministry of Finances uh, who was in charge of this. There are many, many ways to do it. We changed twice. The independent sector changed twice the, uh, the tax code in 2018. Through yes. two different uh, meetings with the ministry, with two different ministers the, that's of, what I'm saying. of finance. It's not important where you are as a person, but as a sector, is the, I mean. But it's not that, it's that uh, in certain, uh, 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 the sector is not important. It's 1.6% when they see the figures, because everybody else, you know, is put together with big companies. You know, and with uh, you know the and uh, the uh, Brecht uh, uh, licensing, mm -hmm. the actual the the, the uh, statistics figure is 1.6. That mm -hmm. lame thing that you saw. Everything else is uh, a certain kind of knowledge. The thing that people uh, a small group of people can get the knowledge about the importance of certain stuff and can mobilize up to a point. At some, uh, uh, for me, it's important for me personally to just build this knowledge to a level where it can function uh, institutionally, let's say, at every time and not with this, uh, you know, uh, Christ over Christ over Christ dynamics. So if you can, in, in make an institution out of, out of this <coughs> crisis management of, you know, the legalese system from uh, of which our lives depends, well, I'm, I'm happy. It's mean work, but that, that's how it is. But yes, it, it, yeah, it matters where you are. The kind of connection you can make with the press, uh, the kind of access that you have, because of, at the other end, in the Ministry of Culture and the Parliament, there are people that have two uh, defects. They don't give a damn, because 1.6. They don't understand anything, because it's so specific. Mm -hmm. Please, and, and in response to Ekman's question, and joining uh, what you're saying, uh, I use a little different word, it's the maturity. Mm. Because it's not, and again, about what you were saying and the ecosystem, it's not up to every one of each of us to do it, but we need to reach that level of maturity to understand the importance of it and to assign a specific player with that ecosystem and support them to properly take it to the professional level. Because advocacy is not only, for example, the advocacy efforts should not be only towards changing the law. An advocacy effort could be to bring other players, to influence uh, decision makers in other spheres. Mm -hmm. And that's a full-time job. It's a skill, actually. You know, in the world of development, world, there are professionals, they call it influencing officer or influencing manager or advocacy professional. And there are strategies, there are research in support of that, there are different ways, like you mentioned, it, it's useless to do an advocacy campaign without having someone to listen, that open to listen to you. And part of the advocacy strategy, for example, is to identify, we call it in their jargon, have a champion within, this is how you strategize also to influence it, to that within the group that you want to influence, you have to identify entry points. We call them champions or entry points. And so you don't have to do it yourself, but you have to be mature enough to say, I will support the emergence and the growth and the skills and technicity and expertise of a group within my ecosystem to lead on that effort. I'll back them up, whether it could be money, could be information, could be connections. But that person or that group will be doing that in my, in, in my um, environment. And that it has, as you said, it has to, to be efficient. We need to take every single player in the ecosystem to the professional level. Otherwise, we're not efficient. I think this, this put, uh, if you put it in mirror with what uh, Naluka said and what I think, of, I guess, all of us feel about this merge of roles 
that each person has in cultural organizations. We are, you are not never just a producer or just a curator or just a dancer or just an advocacy uh, uh, influencer <laughs> or an Instagram influencer, whatever. If you are all of these roles together, then yeah, that's that's the big challenge. If you put that in face in, uh, face to face with the uh, with the realities, that brings up some some challenges in terms of in terms of how we can professionalize actually. How can we actually focus on the things that really matter and the things that are uh, as priorities in our work? And I think I I mean I, I guess all of us here um, are. Hmm? Mm -hmm. No no no. Um, ah, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. I have Sorry. a comment on, uh, on the same sphere, but also a little bit, it, it is a little bit problematic for me because what we're talking about here, it's kind of power dynamics. Mm -hmm. And in countries, and I'm shocked how, how much similarities <laughs> we have, unfortunately for you, uh, in the cultural sector, uh, it, where there is no uh, no artist artist status, so he is he is most of the time on the margin of the formal economy in the in the society and in the cultural production cycle. So if if we are not very critical to to the power dynamics that we have and we practice in the sector as independents we might fall in in the real unfair system and the artist will be marginalized by the sector itself, the art sector itself. And I think it's happening now because we say the influentials have the knowledge, know the right people, na 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 na. And I think we need this a little bit critical approach to this because, and I'll go back to the region, and when we look at what's happening in Lebanon and Algeria now, where I see cultural actors and artists more involved in the, in the popular movement that are taking place in these countries, we can see that we need to be careful because we are, as a sector, on the margin of the economy of our countries, and we are putting our key players on the margin of our sector, and we're creating this um, hierarchy again within, so we're off-Broadway, but we're, coming, uh, we're becoming Broadway, and there is an off-Broadway now. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm clear, because I'm thinking with you, but the power dynamics we're talking about here, for me, are to be very much criticized and they are criticized in many areas in the world. Uh, so unions are becoming against the independent sector itself, not against the authorities that you've been talking about. I think it's a big challenge when you just like in real life, when you realize you are uh, reproducing your parents' patterns, <laughs> not the ones you like usually, yep. <laughs> how do we make sure yep. that we don't reproduce the patterns that they're yep. actually convicted? Authority so of knowledge is, is scary. Yeah. Authority yeah. of knowledge, not only authority of economy or policy making or political decision. Authority of knowledge should be challenged. I surely hope you'll find the answers to that and we will share them with you. Yeah, just, just uh, to add one yeah. thing. I mean, thank you for cl clarifying what I was trying to tell. I mean, yes, that is a <laughs> power issue. And instead of you know, distributing the power, you are becoming one of the powerful. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this ideologically doesn't reflect on to me. I mean, it's good. Yeah. Okay, the, the bells have rang. If yeah. you want to make any closing um, um, statements, that <laughs> it sounds very formal, but just like any. I would just like to, to close from my point of view with a comment on your last comments. Um, because I did my thesis, uh, <coughs> my MA thesis in cultural policy, particularly on looking at advocacy in transition countries with a focus on Romania taking this dual stance of looking it through the lens of pluralistic democracy or deliberative democracy. Mm -hmm. Pluralistic meaning representational, so you kind mm -hmm. of, you know, you, you, you designate the people who represent you in the advocacy game, you as an artist as a, as a culture ma management versus deliberative, 
where you kind of create this context in which everyone has the authority, is giving the authority to have their own saying, and through that uh, you kind of reach a conclusion. And I looked at it, how, how did change actually come about in Romania, because there were some changes before, after the 1990s. I mean, there were some reforms, there were some pieces of legislation that really changed a lot how we fund culture, how mm -hmm. cultural managers are being put in place and taken down and evaluated, so a lot of, a lot of things. And what my, my, my conclusion was uh, that in the end, the, the, the type of advocacy that was put into place was definitely the one um, uh, formulated by the pluralistic democracy model. Advocacy was equated with lobbying. You actually find the, the term lobbying in the policies for culture project, articles about mm -hmm. lobbying for Absolutely. culture. Mm -hmm and somehow with the best of intentions. So it's, it wasn't that someone was attempting to grab the power. It was just this model of expertise that was put in place with the best of inten intentions while neglecting somehow to also develop this democratic spirit in the sense of deliberative democracy and creating forums, creating agoras, creating these spaces where more people could have been included. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow I feel that, you know, we should work. We should work to 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 provide another model in doing that. Yeah. Very yeah. Tom. Some final thoughts. Well, for me, it's Some always final. It's, it's emotions <laughs> in, in the end, you know. And uh, and the one question that always lingers with me is. How does it work when you feel that individually it doesn't work for you? Yeah. That that emotionally you're emo emotionally and physically you're exhausted and you can't find a way to to position in that system and and find um, a solution that could structurally work, not that would, but who could, you know, that you don't find that that type of hope. And and personally, I am in that space. Of mm -hmm. Julia. Some thoughts for tomorrow. <laughs> symbolical, symbolical tomorrow. <laughs> for later. None. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining. Yes. Thank you for coming. The talk, the conversation. Thank you for being here and have a great time in the next days. I guess. Yeah, Is that the thing? Can I say? Yeah. <laughs>